Sounds like I hear a noise. I can't tell what it is. Must be rain. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sort of? Yeah, number four. Turn it up if you want to. Hello, hello, hello. How about now? Can you hear me? Better? Turn the rain off. It works better. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Amen. So, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. It's a great verse. And 24. May God himself, God himself, not a substitute, not somebody else. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Pretty good. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is like a sharp sword penetrating to the dividing of soul and spirit. Sometimes we kind of mush those together, soul and spirit. And neither of them can you see, so it's not too hard to mush them together. But they're different. Those two passages declare they're different. In Luke 16, 19 through 24, Jesus tells the story about a rich man and a poor man. A poor man named Lazarus is laid at the gate of the rich man, and he eats the crumbs that fall from the table. He's covered with sores, and the dogs lick his sores, and he's in great agony. Well, they both die. Lazarus, the beggar, goes to Abraham's side, the rich man goes to hell. They can see each other. Their bodies are in the grave, but they can see each other. The rich man calls out for help, and Abraham says, I'm sorry, we can't get to you, and you can't get to us. You see, when we die, when we leave this body, when our body physically dies, our spirit and our soul will still live. The question is, where? You see, there is eternal life and there is eternal death. Which will we choose? That's our choice. You know, this whole life we spend on earth, there's mainly one chore. And that's to decide if we're going to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, receive the forgiveness that he paid for, or reject it. In our culture, movies, we think they promulgate, they show us stories where you get the idea that when you die, it's just over, like turning off a light, turning off a TV set turning off a, a sheep or a goat or a dog. You just die and it's black and there's nothing. Well, that's not true. The Bible says it's not true. In Ecclesiastes, it says God puts in the heart of every man eternity. Inside, you know that it's not true. I had a biology professor who claimed to be an atheist at University of Tulsa. I really loved him. He was a great man, brilliant. He had critters named after him. He was pretty famous. Went on a trip with him to Florida to get a extinct plant, or going extinct. And he started talking. And we talked, and I, I was just kind of listening. I wasn't prompted in this conversation. He said, you know, it's hard, it's hard to imagine an end to life. And it's hard to imagine it not ending. He 
You see, he knew inside there was an eternity. He knew there was more than this life. People that claim to be atheists are not really being very honest with themselves. I think it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. You got to work at it to be an atheist. It takes work. I don't think he really was an atheist. And inside every man is the knowledge of eternity. The other myth that's prompted today in our culture is that heaven will be boring and hell won't be so bad. It'll kind of be like that bar on that TV show, Cheers, where everybody knows your name, right? No, it won't be like that. Heaven is going to be unimaginably good. Boring? Our mind will be so on fire every second for the rest of eternity just looking at stuff. We will be so, wow. There will not be a boring second ever, 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 and ever. But hell will be unimaginably bad. In Revelation, it's called the lake of fire. That doesn't sound very good. Jesus talked a lot about hell. He says, where their worm never dies. I don't even know what that stuff means, but it doesn't sound good. You see, for those who reject God, who reject what Jesus did for them, then they'll have to go to a place where the unbelievers go. And that's called the lake of fire. It's called the second death. It's called eternal death. It would be nice for those people if there was nothing, if it was just turned off. It's sort of wishful thinking on their part. You see, if we say we believe this Bible, then everybody we meet is going one place or the other. And we need to be bold enough to ask them. If we really have that love we talk about, we need to ask them where they're going. In Matthew 10, 28, it says, Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. We have a choice, and everybody we know has a choice. And now is the time. Now is the day of salvation, and that's why we built this place. That's why we're here. I think just about every event we have, there are people that come in thinking they're just going to run a barrel race or rope a little. And some crazy old fat guy with a microphone is telling them about Jesus. Unexpectedly, they hear. And I can see on their faces that sometimes they've never heard the story. They didn't know that Jesus fed 5,000. They didn't know that he walked on water. They didn't know that he loves them. We need to be telling them. We've got the good news. We need to be telling people so that they can choose life. You know, a fellow named Nicodemus went to see Jesus. Nicodemus was a righteous man. In that day and time, of all the people living on earth, Nicodemus was right up there. He'd been in the top ten righteous people. He wasn't, a, he wasn't particularly a hypocrite. He was intrigued by Jesus. He saw the miracles. He was drawn to him. He was a little bit worried about what his other Pharisee buddies thought about it, and so he came at night, secret, to talk to Jesus because he needed to know what was going on. He said, we know you come from God because you couldn't do those things unless you were from God. He was kind of flattering Jesus a little bit. He wasn't perfect, 
but he was an honest, righteous man. But he wasn't righteous enough. He wasn't good enough. And Jesus cut through it and said, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Nicodemus didn't know what to say. What? What, what do you mean? I have to go back in my mother's womb, be born again? He didn't get it. Jesus said there's physical birth and there's spiritual birth. He talked about the spirit. He said it's like the wind. You see the trees move, but you don't really see the wind. You see the effects of the wind. See, even Nicodemus needed a new heart. He needed to be born again. Nobody is good enough. Everybody has come short of the glory of God. You see, your inner man, that spirit we talked about, you were born with a sin nature. You were born a child of the devil. You were prone to sin. That was your nature. And you can't just do better. Well, I'm going to do better now. No, you won't. You might do it for a week or two. You might do it for a year or two, but it's still not good enough. You can't go take a self-help course and do better because you're not ever going to be better enough. You know how we mark a child's growth on a wall in the bedroom or something? We put a little line up and put a date. Well, you know, we might have a child stand over there and a few years later they're going to be taller and a few years later they're going to be taller. But we're not ever have, going to ever have to put a mark on that white part up there because that's an eight feet sheet of plywood. I've never met anybody eight foot tall. I guess they're there, but I've never met one. I'd give you a crick in the neck. Where, how are you doing? I've seen some tall basketball players, but there's not anybody in here going to get higher than that, and nobody's going to reach the ceiling. No matter how good you make yourself, you're not going to be good enough. You can't do it. You got to be born again. You need a new heart. You need that old one taken out and a new one put in. You need a new you. You know, as a natural man, I heard people talk about that. They think about heaven. Well, you know, I'm pretty good. I'm I'm pretty good. I've done done all right. I'll I'll come up there and shake God's hand. We'll work it out. Oh no. No. Our God is a consuming fire. A natural man can't stand in his presence. No. You'd be burnt up. You got to be born again. When you turn to Jesus and believe in him and receive him as your Lord and Savior, a miracle happens. A miracle. Bigger than feeding 5,000, bigger than walking on water. A miracle happens inside of you. The Holy Spirit comes into your spirit. That old nature, that old man, that old sin thing is taken and put on the cross with Jesus. And it dies. And you're born again, a new creature. You're reborn from the dead. A brand new creation. You see, right then, when you're born again, you receive eternal life. Not later, not coming someday. Right then, when you're born again, you have eternal life. And the righteousness of God in Christ is in you. Not because you're any more righteous than you were a few seconds ago, but because God is in you. And at that same instant, you receive forgiveness for all your sins. They're already paid for, but you receive it. When you're born again, you're a new man, and you have a new nature. 
That old nature was prone to sin. Your new nature is prone to righteousness. It's prone to obedience. You know, that old nature, that old sin nature, might occasionally do something good, but it doesn't make that person good. He's still dead in his trespasses and sins. Sometimes people do good things, but inside they're still selfish. But you, with your new nature, with the Spirit of God inside of you, might do something wrong, but you're still born again. You're still a new creature because you're prone to righteousness. And if we sin, we confess it, and he cleanses us. But it doesn't change who you are. You see, before you're born again, you have no hope. But when you're born again, you have the life of God inside of you. And after you're born again, you still have two more parts of you to deal with. You got your soul, which contains your mind, your will, your emotions, your thinking part. All those things are involved with thinking, like a computer. Paul says you got to renew your mind. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can know what the good and pleasing and perfect will of God is. You need new software. You got old software. You got old habits of thinking. You got sin habits of thinking. And when you're born again, you've got to change your habitual thinking. You got to think differently. You got to get the Word of God in there. First Peter 2 2, it says, like newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world, word. Sincere milk of the word that you can grow up into salvation. You see, when you read the epistles, when you read Romans and First and Second Corinthians and First and Second Peter and James, you've got to know who they're talking about. What part of you they're talking about. Or it gets very confusing. Because Paul talks about all three parts. And you've got to know what he's talking about. In Philippians 2, 12, it says, work out your own salvation with trembling. You've got to work it out. Like a master builder works out the wood on a cabinet. He gets the imperfections out. He sands it and planes it. Somebody working with metal, they keep working it out. They keep working the imperfections out until they get it to where, it's, where they want it. You've got to work that old thinking out and replace it with the Word of God. You've got to work that stuff out of your brain. You've got to work those habits, those ways of thinking out of your mind so that you can grow up to salvation. You see, he's not talking about being born again. When you're born again, your spirit is brand new. But you've got to get your mind together. You've got to get your mind renewed. And that's by the Word of God. That's by filling your mind with the Word of God. New software. Here it is. Word of God 1.0. You, you don't need another version. That verse in Philippians was verse 12, the second chapter. Verse 13 says... For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. we got to work it out. But he's working inside of us to help us work it out so that he can get us where he wants us to be, so that we can hear. We can hear what he says to us. Words of instruction, assignments, words of comfort, Maybe words of correction. He does correct us. He does it with the word. 
He speaks to us, and we need to be listening. And then we got to control our body, our flesh, our desires, our appetites. Paul says, I buffet my body. I beat it up. I get it under control. Because you see that old man, that old man with that old sin nature, the lusts of the flesh control everything. Controls your thinking, controls your spirit. That old man, the body's in control. But the new man, your newborn spirit, can now be in control, can dominate your mind and your body. But you have to put the word in. You have to listen. You have to draw near so that you can cooperate with him. And when all those things begin to happen, you can say, like Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded. You need to get to that part that in your brain, in your mind, in your computer, you can say, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed. We can get to that place where you can say, I know, I know whom I believe it, whom I believed and am persuaded that he's able. You see, God is in you, working in you to help you. In Corinthians, it says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, it says, by faith, Jesus will come in. And God is in there too. They're inside of you. There is no other temple for God in this age, the church age. We are the temple. You and I are the temple of God. He is in here. He is in you. If you're born again, he is in you. Back in the day when they had the temple, Solomon's temple, Solomon was the son of King David, King Solomon built a temple. They had an inner chamber called the Holy of Holies. They took the Ark of the Covenant. They put it in there. They got everything ready. They did all the sacrifices. Solomon prayed. Big assembly. All the nation was there. Solomon prayed and asked God to come and inhabit his temple. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifices, and a cloud of glory went into the temple so thick that the priests couldn't stay in there. They all came out. And nobody could go in. It was the glory of God. The presence of God filled the temple. There's a word Shekinah that I've heard people use. Shekinah glory. Shekinah is not even in the Bible. It's not a word in the Bible. It's rabbinic literature. It's rabbis talking about the Old Testament. But it means the place where the presence of God is. The dwelling place. The sitting place where God sits, where God dwells, well, he filled that temple. It became the Shekinah, where he sat. And you know what? The deal is that now, in the day of the church, the age of grace, the age of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Shekinah is right here, and it's right there in you. The glory of God is in you. Just like it filled the temple, it's filling you. God Almighty is in you. My youngest granddaughter up in Idaho when she was about two, when she'd pray after going to Sunday school, she'd say, Mommy, let's pray. And she'd look down at her chest and pray because they told her Jesus was in her heart. He is. You know, the Jewish people, they prayed to heaven. They lifted, you know, they looked around up there. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with it. But as a matter of fact, he's right here in you and in me. The glory of God. We have that glory in us. We have the life of God in us, the love of God in us. We're born again. We're a new creation, and we are the righteousness of God 
in Christ. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's us. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, you have to be in him. And that's how you stand before the God of heaven. That's how you enter into the presence of God. And we're told in Hebrews that we have access, bold access. We can come before him like children come to their parents or grandparents. Bold access because we are in Jesus who paid our debt, who caused us to be born again. Is it because we are good? No. Is it because we're worthy? No. He is good, and he is worthy. I've been told most of my life in most churches, you need to do good. You need to do good. You need to make yourself better so that you'll be better. No. No. We need to do good. You need to do good. You need to walk in love. You need to prefer one another. You need to lay down your life in preference to someone else. You need to do good, but not to be good, not to get better for yourself. No, you do good because you are good, because of Jesus that is in you, the Holy Spirit that is in you. You do good because you are good. You don't do good to earn brownie points. You don't do good to make God like you. You don't do good to be worthy, because you're not. Never will be. You'll never be that tall. But you do good because God has already made you that worthy. God has made you good. God has made you righteous because of his great love for us. We didn't deserve any of it. But the fact is, he's in us. The fact is, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And we ought to act like it. We ought to act like it. We carry around God Almighty inside of us. And we ought to share him with a world that's going to hell. People don't like to talk about hell. Churches don't talk about hell anymore, at least in America. But we need to. We need to speak the word with boldness. Father, I thank you for your great mercy that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you made us alive with Christ Jesus. For it is by grace we have been saved. You have set us together with him in heavenly places. That's who we are and where we are. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I pray that you open the eyes of our hearts that we can understand the hope of our calling and the power toward us who believe and the riches of the inheritance in the saints that we can know your love. Open our eyes. Let us draw near so that we can stand not only in your presence, but we can stand in the place that we need to be to proclaim your name to all those about us. Show us what you'd have us do. You know, if, if you're not born again, if you've not asked Jesus into your heart, it's not a hard thing to do. It's as simple as falling off a log. You have to believe that he's the son of God and that God raised him from the dead, that he died on a cross to 
pay for your sins and invite him to be your Lord, master, boss. And you can be born again. I'm going to ask us all to shut our eyes a minute like we were praying. Maybe my, I'm, my, I'll be the only two eyes open. And if you want to ask Jesus in your heart, if you've never done that, if today's the day that you've decided that you need Jesus to be your Lord, that you want to be born again so that you can have eternal life, I want you to raise your hand so that I can pray for you. Just stick it up. Father, I thank you for your love and your mercy. I thank you for these that are here. I thank you for the word that you've spoken to them. And I pray that you bless us and hold us close and open our hearts to you. We commit our way to you and our life to you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song.